Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs may be less popular than the MBTI, but the value that this correct application of Maslow's theory may bring to a business is incomparably higher. Recently, I was repeatedly asked by a couple of clients if the MBTI and the Maslow's pyramid should be applied together. That was an unexpected question, and so I decided to look at the two tools together, and I noticed some unexpected parallels and even more notable differences that we should discuss before applying either of these tools. Although the creators of this, these two instruments hardly knew that, they both lived at about the same time and worked at about the same time in the same country, and both were interested in Carl Jung's work. Both conceived their ideas early in their lives, but the results of their labor were made public only in the 1940s. And both Maslow's hierarchy and Myers-Briggs type index, popular as they may sound today, received limited or no attention for the first 20 years of their official existence. Maslow's theory of human motivation was based entirely on Abraham Maslow's personal observations. He was an academic. He was interested in seeing patterns and connecting dots. He didn't care much about empirical proof, but just shared his findings with the world. In addition, like most bright scientists, and reportedly his IQ was sky high, Maslow was a very poor salesman. The MBTI was a different story. It was not something new. It was a simplified derivative of Carl Jung's categories described in his book Psychological Types. Isabel Myers, the driver behind the MBTI test, was not a scientist but rather a housewife. But she was in love with her baby as she called her invention and was passionately convinced of its validity. Before she committed her entire self to her type indicator, she wrote detective stories while taking care of her two kids. Her two murder mysteries were successful commercially, but you won't find them in your library, especially not the second one. What sold well in the US in the 1930s in modern times would have killed the entire MBTA brand because our society has evolved. It was through Isabel's dedication and decades of relentless effort that made the MBTI the most popular personality sorter of all time and by far the most successful commercially. Still in 1960s, while both creators were still alive and active, Maslow's theory was apparently better known because Abraham Maslow was already an established academic and you would agree that a high status always helps. In addition, psychologists look down on non-professionals and they were Carl Jung, whom we may safely call the biological father of the type indicator, turned down Isabel's request to meet and to look at her baby. By the 1960s, Isabel Myers could still not break through the glass wall of professional arrogance and the MBTI had maybe two institutional clients only. After Maslow's untimely death in 1970, his theory began to lose prominence while Isabel continued working, continued her marketing push, and the MBTI popularity continued to grow. Already after her death, though, in about the year 2000, most of the Fortune 100 companies use the MBTI test regularly, with two and a half million people taking the test every year. Though research demonstrates that at least three quarters of the MBTI test takers end up with a different personality each time they retake the test. Moreover, there is no scientific base behind it, but millions of cult-like followers around the world remain faithful and confident and enthusiastic about the tool to this day. Abraham Maslow was also criticized for the lack of the empirical support, but for a different reason. In the case of the MBTI, the research confirmed the lack of scientific 
foundation and a very low reproducibility of the test results. Plus, most of the available research data came from the MBTI proponents themselves. In Maslow's case, research data from independent scientists has produced fairly good results. Perhaps we should also realize that in both cases the researchers faced a major challenge. They needed to measure and assess the results of what had been until that moment considered to be unmeasurable or even non-existent. What helped the MBTI cult to grow was the simplistic concept of the tool. Although not intentionally, it proved to be a winning one. All MBTI profiles are consistently agreeable and easy to digest, providing a guaranteed assurance of what many lay people wanted to hear. Plus, the 16 profiles are arranged in a simple, nicely colored 4x4 matrix, which creates a visual anchor similar to what the pyramid was to Maslow's hierarchy. Although the pyramid proved to be a powerful visual anchor, Abraham Maslow never used any pyramid to explain his theory. The idea to use the pyramid as a visual aid was introduced by a couple of authors who were much more business oriented and suggested to use Maslow's theory to generate workforce motivation strategies that would achieve maximum motivation at the lowest cost. This is not what Maslow had in mind, and although he never used the pyramid after that or before that, it was the perceived clarity of its levels, steps, and colors that helped Maslow's theory gain popularity and eventually stand the test of time. Ironically, this same pyramid is the root cause of many criticisms of Maslow's theory. As the multicolored triangle has been etched in our minds, many authors, in fact, criticized not the theory but the pyramid. The most common fallacy is saying that Maslow stated that a lower need must be completely satisfied before a higher need emerges. Maslow never said that. On the contrary, his vision was that all human needs are always present and it's their relative prepotency that changes because of the circumstances or personal development. I hear you saying enough trivia, what's in it for me? How do I apply the two tools? Both the pyramid and the MBTI are supposedly performance improvement tools. Even if they are, I would not keep them in the same toolbox. Full disclosure, I do not carry the MBTI tool in my toolbox at all. Which doesn't mean that you should not, because quite a few people do use it, and in the end it's up to you to decide whether your team or yourself will benefit from this tool. According to its proponents, the MBTI test gets you to know your communication style, and the improvement of the team performance comes as the result of MBTI-inspired conversations. I doubt that there is a lot of value in that, but I would agree that the MBTI could be a good icebreaker, especially for your first team meeting, because it does make people, to, often total strangers, talk. Maslow's theory is more fundamental and its value is not immediately clear to the in uninitiated. It becomes a powerful tool in combination with more recent findings in social psychology that complement and expand Maslow's motivation theory. One such tool that I want to tell you about is the theory of basic human values created in the 1990s by social psychologist Professor Shalom Schwartz. Unlike Maslow, Schwartz arranged basic human values in a circle, thereby making them a priori equal. So the clockwise sequence of basic human values follows the pyramid's progression of human needs. By placing all values on the same level, the Schwartz model implies that all values are present in every individual at any time, but some of them become more prominent eventually 
as if they are taking up more space in one's worldview, but they do not become higher or lower than any other values at any time. Schwartz's circumplex aligns with Maslow's vision that all human needs are always present and not abandoned when a high level need emerges, as the image of the pyramid would imply. In addition, Schwartz's extensive cross-cultural research data supports his values structure, and that indirectly confirms Maslow's motivation hierarchy, which otherwise was attributed by his critics to Maslow's own U.S. middle-class culture pattern, thereby ignoring existing cross-cultural differences, which was another popular line of unfair attacks on Maslow's model. Based on the combined Maslow-Schwartz model of motivation, we came up with our collective culture compass, an assessment tool that maps individual values of the team members and calculates the team's alignment ratio. Teams are most efficient when their individual profiles are congruent. This happens when the team members are united by shared core values, measured by the alignment ratio. Of course, even a very congruent team is effective within uh, the organization when the team's values are in turn aligned with the real meaningful values of the organization, not those aspirational values that look and sound cool, but usually are lacking. And this is where the opposition to the two becomes almost palpable. Because the purpose and values of the organization must be clear, meaningful, and accepted by the entire team before we apply the tool. Let's face it, not many organizations have purpose and values that they genuinely adhere to. And if you are not there yet, you still can use it practically in business situation as a, either a selection or an assessment tool. If you have the luxury to select your people, then selecting a team of people with matching congruent profiles has a good chance to put together a team that will demonstrate superior performance. And if those values are also aligned with the values of the organization, the team will become the driving force of the organization. In case of an already existing team, the tool will predict its potential by measuring the individual profile's alignment of members and weeding out the probable misfits. So if you have an aligned team, then passing the MBTI test will not add any value. If your team is not aligned, then passing the MBTI test will not help you either. Moreover, the MBTI test results may be even misleading. Isabel Myers herself once admitted to a friend that had she known the psychological type of her husband, she would have never married him. And for your information, they were married happily for 62 years until his death. So it's not surprising that finally in the last decade or so, Maslow's theory of human motivation and related models are gaining ground. Now advanced organizations have realized that cultural alignment, and that basically means shared core values, is the most important predictor of the future performance. For many years, Maslow's theory of human motivation was considered untestable and unmeasurable in our very materialistic world. Today, measuring and monitoring team alignment as a leading KPI is becoming the standard of the knowledge economy. So if yours is a good company, planning to be the best, it's time to pay attention to what motivates your team and consider adding the alignment ratio to the list of your key performance indicators. In the meantime, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments. And if you learn something new from this video, click subscribe and we'll meet again soon.